So today's topic, by Melody Grows, is 10 dialogue tricks to make your characters talk good. And her topic info is despite writer's efforts to describe the place, the setting, actions, <coughs> motivations, and characters, what matters most is the dialogue. However, what characters say to each other or themselves tell the story. As humans, readers relate to characters, and that's what writers want. In this talk, she'll explore 10 dialogue tricks to help you, the writer, create characters that seem real. They, they are to us, the writer, they might as well also be to the reader. We spend so much time with them, they talk to us all the time. Um, Melody's bio, New Mexico native Melody Groves lives life of a full-time freelance writer. She travels the world, meets amazing people, and writes about it all. She's the winner of numerous writing awards. She's the author of the award-winning Colton Brothers Saga. Series set in 1860s, southern New Mexico, Arizona, border ambush, Sonoran Rage, Arizona War, Kansas Bleeds, and Black Range Revenge with Trail to Tin Town in the Pipeline. In addition to that series, she penned She Was Sheriff, set in 1872, Northern California. Melody also writes nonfiction books and it includes New Mexico Book Award winner Hoist a Cold One. Please give Melody a warm welcome. Over 20 years ago, there was a young woman who stood at the doors of the, uh, the church, the other church where Southwest Riders used to meet. And that woman stood there knowing that she really wanted to write, but not knowing what to do. <coughs> a man came out and said, hi, my name is Jeffrey. I'm a Southwest Riders. Are you new? <laughs> yeah, and she did. She said, absolutely new. He says, well, come on in. This is a place where you're going to learn how to write and to meet amazing people. She walked in and immediately found a home. That was over 20 years ago, and I want to thank those of you who have been there over 20 years for welcoming, welcoming me into the folds of writers. If it hadn't been for Jeffrey standing there talking to me, turns out he also wrote westerns, which there's not a lot of us who do that. I probably would not have stayed. I was incredibly nervous, but I'm so glad I did, and I so appreciate Jeffrey, who has gone somewhere. I don't think he's dead, but he's not here. <laughs> so when I say gone on, I, I don't know where he went to. I have sat where you are sitting, not only here, but in the other church, trying to process what people are telling me. And Jeffrey was also the one who, at one point, was standing here, and he was giving a talk. And he said, for your career and your writing career, there's two things you can do. You have to make a choice. You can either write for the church newsletter, your family newsletter, you can write lovely Christmas letters, and be a writer, or you can figure out if you want your name in lights, if you would like your name on the front of the book. And up until that time, I had been wishy-washy. I was like, well, I'm not really sure. I don't know what I want to do. I just know I want to write. And that particular moment was like the light bulb. Went, ah, name in lights is what I want. And that's where I, I pursued. And I'm so glad I went to that meeting, like you are here today, because really it changed my life. Those two sentences that he said changed my life. It gave me focus. I decided I'm going to get published, dog on it. And as many of you have attested to today, it's not an easy road, but it's one that's 
It's doable. Those of us who are published, at least for myself, I'm still constantly amazed that people will spend the time not only to read my book when I uh, submit it, that they like my book enough that they're going to spend some money to publish it. And it, it costs the publishers money. Uh, I had one publisher say, well, $8,000 per title, thinking, okay. But then I also have to thank the people who take their time to read what I've written. And I just received a compliment today. Somebody said, I read your book and I really enjoyed it. That, that's the price and the highest that you can ever ask for, as far as I'm concerned. So in order to help you today become a better writer, we're going to talk about dialogue. You were kind of wondering where I was going to, right? How I was going to get to dialogue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Back when I first started writing, and again, I write Westerns. Bless you. And the Western dialogue is very interesting. But back in the day, when I first started writing Westerns, I was so proud of myself. And so I went to my mom, who was a published writer and wrote really, really well. I said, hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at describing scenery, and I'm pretty good at characterization, and my actions, oh, pretty good too, but man, what I really do best is dialogue. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she did not say a word. <laughs> she says, well, I, I like the cover of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, taking down a few pegs, I started looking at this, and went, you know, maybe my dialogue isn't the best. It's a little too staid, a little too, too not what people actually say. So I've taken a few classics, I've done a lot of research, a lot of reading, and have come up with these 10 dialogue tricks that I thought, the 10 tricks of dialogue writing that I thought I would uh, like to share with you all today. And hopefully even one of these will make sense to you and you can uh, apply it to your own writing. So why is dialogue important? Why, why, why? The answer is actually pretty simple. It's because we're human. We connect with other people. And the way we do that is through language. Even sign language. Even people who don't speak or can hear communicate. So your dialogue is critical for you, the writer, to connect with them, the reader. And we do it through being humans together. You really do have a connection with your reader, whether you'd like to, like to think about that or not. You owe them a great deal in having the best dialogue available and the best story available that, that, that we have. Dialogue. The written dialogue is a strange, strange mixture of actual words and imagery. And it's not two people talking to each other. And I'm going to give you some examples here in just a little bit. Okay. It's hard to get good help nowadays. <laughs> well, you have to give me a signal. Like yeah. Okay, Michelle, now. <laughs> okay, the first tip is identify what you want to express, what emotion. You need an emotion for each scene that you have. You're going to have an overlying emotion. And this is a trick that I have reverted back to, I can't tell you how many times. I think my dialogue is, it's okay. And then I think, oh, wait, 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 what, what are, what's the overlying emotion of this scene? Is it love? And what kind of love is there? Is it joy? Like this young lady here? Is it frustration? Confusion? Lust? Excitement? There's got to be an emotion, and it doesn't have to be strong, but you, you 
as the writer, the creator of these people, these characters, whether they're animals or humans, they're all characters, some are more characters than others. You have to know who these people are, who these animals are. You have to know the characters. And so once you can figure out what the emotion is of that scene, it actually comes together so much easier. But you have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to get in the head of your characters and know what emotion they're doing. The next one, You really need to see the scenario clearly in your head. I've tried to write, as I'm guessing some of you have too, just kind of write. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute, where am I? What am I doing? Where are these people? Why, why are they talking to each other? Are they talking? I don't know what I'm, what's going on. Sometimes, at least my characters, tend to get away from me. And they'll go do their own thing. And then sometimes I struggle to catch up. But if you can see the scene clearly in your head and even smell what's going on, you're 10 steps ahead of where you were previously. So the scenario, you have to know why the people are talking. Why? Why, why are they talking? <coughs> Your question is, does it move the action forward? If it doesn't move the action forward or the character gives it more information, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, it shouldn't be there. Does it provide background information? And we're talking dialogue. <coughs> does it provide any background information? You can have two people talking and one of them says, well, you know, Bill, I've never liked snakes. And that's all you need to get background information. But it gives us a little, another chip about that person's uh, character. So now we know that the other guy, the guy who's talking, doesn't like snakes. It's just that easy. Does it reveal a person's uh, Person, a character's personality. And does it get attention? By the way, I'll be happy to answer questions along the way. I don't I don't have an aversion to stopping. The tension could be pretty much anything, but it has to be tense enough that your reader is going to want to turn the page. What you don't want is for it to be boring enough or have no reason to turn the page. Because if they don't turn the page, they are going to close your book, put it down, and never get back to it. And you don't want that. Give it just enough tension for them to think, oh, well, I wonder what's going to happen next. This next one is a big one. What does each character want? And once you figure this out, your dialogue becomes easy. So your characters are going to want something, and the characters that are in, on, in the scene at that moment, they walk into the scene. They all want something, even what I call the walk-ons, the, the, the background guys, the ones who have maybe one or two words of dialogue and they don't really do a whole lot. They, everybody wants something. But think about it today with you all. You walked in wanting something. You either wanted to get a donut? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Who did? You maybe wanted to see some friends that you hadn't seen since last year. Maybe you wanted to talk about your successes. Maybe you wanted to learn something about dialogue. You all had a reason for stepping through those doors. 
you wanted something, and right now you probably want something. You want the speaker to hurry up and be done. <laughs> no. 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 I still got time. <laughs> you all want something. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, I should have got another cup of coffee. Where's my donut? We all want something at every given minute. And your characters, what's nice about being a writer, one of the things I love about being a writer, is that the writer is in control of the characters. You can make them hungry. You can make them full. You can make them short, tall, fat, skinny, old, young. The, the, the powers are in your fingers, literally, and, uh, and up here in your head, of course. They want something. So when the character comes into the scene, you need to know what they want. Do they want to get across the street? Do they want a glass of water? Do they want to uh, lure the little girl into the car? Ooh. What, do they, what do they want? I know some of you are writing kind of creepy stuff. <laughs> I love creepy stuff. So you need to define in every scene <coughs> what, each, what each character wants, what their goal is. saves a baby as a hero. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the police off. Yeah, we know we know that category of heroes. On paper, in your story, you will have a hero. You only have one. Now I argued that point several years ago. I thought I had two. Because I write my my two <coughs> brothers, I write either two, three or four brothers. And the first couple of books I wrote I had the brothers doing what I thought were pretty much the same thing. And somebody, again, Southwest writer, said, no, 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 you have a hero. Well, I have two heroes. No, you only have one. Your story can only have one hero. The hero is a main character. Now, you have main characters, the ones who do most of the story. But you only have one hero. The hero is the person the protagonist, the good guy, who uh, vanquishes the bad guy, or dies trying to do it. Think about the Wizard of Oz. Who was the hero? Dorothy, right. And who was the protagonist? Who was the antagonist? The bad guy. <laughs> Yeah, the Witch of the West, absolutely. Now, what, how would the story have been different if it had been the Cowardly Lion, the Scarecrow, and Dorothy all being a hero? It would have been a, a mess. So you have one hero. And if you're like me, when I first started writing my, my guys, is what I call them, the boys, it was really confusing because I had the two heroes, and so I, I feel I kind of felt like I had to sacrifice one of them. So you don't sacrifice them, but you kind of make one of them stronger. Now, the stronger one, the hero, is the one who, like I said, vanquishes the villain, the antagonist, the bad guy. Only that person can do that, or they die trying. Uh, I know some of the genres out there, your main character, your hero never dies. But in westerns, they die sometimes. <laughs> it's really, really hard to do a sequel when the, the main guy dies. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so a couple of the books I've written where it, at the end it's like, oh, I don't know if they live or die, and I'm here at the end, of course, because you're going to have that rising action. And you think, well, there's a sequel. Of course they live. Duh, but that's neither here nor there. 
question? Yes. Um, is it possible to have a two-person hero thing because they're a team working on something? No. Okay. No. You have to have a hero. You can have a very close second. Okay. The hero, you can identify the hero. He or she is the one who does the most changing. Okay. They can change all the way to death. <laughs> Which is pretty dramatic, you got to admit. They do the most changing. They, they see the light, uh, they figure out what was going on, they rescue the kitty, they do whatever, but they change. Your character will change. Um, Actually, half of a page here from my book, Arizona War. I don't normally do this, but I thought it really was appropriate for the talk today. Um, just hate to say this, commercial break, but my books are for sale. <laughs> you know, hey, what can I say? Uh, let me, I'm just going to read some dialogue, dialogue here. And uh, this takes place in Tucson. Uh, both of my characters, Andy and James. James is the hero because he does the most changing. He's kind of a wimpy hero, but he's the hero nevertheless. And they are about to go into war. They're going to march off to California. And this is historically correct. Uh, this book is one of my most historically correct books. I mean, I don't change history at all, but <laughs> I put a lot of, of history in here. So here's some of the dialogue that's, that's going down. The younger brother is very excited to be going off to war. The older one, who had been captured by Cochise, was not real excited to go off to war. So this is, this is the dialogue between them. So Andy stopped in front of the tent. He says, too bad we got to run from old Baylor, but once we joined up with Carlton's boys, we're going to make those Reds wish they had never been born. Andy sighted an imaginary rifle along its barrel. He pushed aside the tent box and stepped in. James shook his head and frowned. You just not gonna be happy till you get your head blown off, are you? I'll be fine, Andy sighted his rifle again. It's Johnny Reb that ought to be scared. You just don't get it, do you? James grabbed a shirt off of his uh, off his cot and spun around to face his brother. We've had this conversation before, but guess you weren't listening. Your people die. They quit breathing. No more plans for the future. No more tomorrows. No nothing. No, you don't get it, brother. Do you hear the conflict between these two? You can nod. Yes, there's conflict. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like uh, Christmas at your house, right? Yes. <laughs> it says, no, you don't get it, brother, and you weren't listening. Andy drilled a finger into his own chest. I'm a soldier. It's my job to stop the enemy and kill him if I have to. This is war. Yeah, people die. What do you expect? Jake says, I guess I expect too much. So that's a, an example, I hope, of what each of them want. Andy wants, can't wait and wants to be a soldier and go out and, and kill Johnny Reb because he's a Union soldier. And James, who's been through Hell and back and said, mm, not so fast. So what that particular scene does right there is there's conflict between the two brothers, and yet we have, a, I think, a clear definition of what each of them wants. James does not want to go, but he's in the army and he has to. And Andy is like, well, Andy's 16, and should not have been in the army because he's too young, but nevertheless. So he's like, you know, this, this young pup going, oh yeah, let's, let's gun and kill somebody. All right, each character wants to win the scene. And that's kind of a strange thought and a strange thing to uh, be talking about. But when your characters come on the, the scene, they each want to win because they have a goal and they want to win. And there are people in this room today who do the same thing, is they want to win whatever is going on the scene. And let me give you an example in my book. 
she was sheriff. I really feel uncomfortable doing this, but you know, I'm familiar with this dialogue. So uh, I know some of you have read it, and I just wanted you to know that the sequel is coming out hopefully soon. Yes. Street. She became sheriff of this little tiny town up in Northern California in 1872. Uh, she had no background at all in law enforcement. She is the daughter of the bank president and had never been to a saloon, had never ridden a horse, uh, had never shot a gun, uh, had never done a whole bunch of things, but here she is. So she's needing to get a posse together. And she has a buddy of hers, um, who this the mayor actually, who has come in to help her get this posse together. <clears throat> Says now was now was my opportunity to speak. How to get their attention? I certainly wasn't going to wave a little white bar flag because that's what the saloon uh, barkeep had told her to do to get their attention to wave a little white flag. <laughs> yeah, like that works. <laughs> No, I, I pushed that embarrassing memory to one side, choosing instead to stand on my tiptoes and holler, Men, men, I need your attention. Nobody acknowledged my presence. Seth, who's the man? Sit. Frustrated, I pulled out my gun. Seth stood upright. You gonna shoot him? <laughs> <laughs> Banging it against the wooden bar at least sounded like a, a judge's gavel. Conversations ebbed, then sputtered into silence. Thank you, I said. I need a few good men. Hell, on, we're all good men. Cat calls and whistles split the silence. Thunderous laughter swirled over rude suggestions. I'm man enough for you. Holding up my hand, signaling for quiet, I was grateful. Um, it shielded my face, undoubtedly gloomy into a lovely shade of crimson. For a posse, those who, those who hooligans escaped. Escape with me, darling, one man offered. His bowler canted sideways. He held up a hand and staggered upright. I saw her first. Another man jumped to his feet. His hands fisted like a besotted gunfighter. Seth stepped up next to me. Listen to what the lady has to say, would you? To my surprise, both drunk sat immediately like children who'd been scolded. We've got a right at first light. Prisoners escape from your town. Ride with me and we'll get them back. I hoped my enthusiasm to this quest showed. I may be your sheriff, but you're the citizens. Together, we can bring these men to justice. Not right with no female sheriff, someone hollered. No telling where we're likely to end up. <laughs> Hell, all she'll do is talk, yak, yak, yak. No wonder them old boys escaped. She probably near melted their ears right off. <laughs> Women should be doing men's work, the voice came out of the corner. Yeah, <laughs> why don't you go bake a pie? Cheers went up. A frowning Seth gave the entire room his famous hairy, hairy eyeball glance. Long and probing, nothing, pretty much everyone ignored him, the voices remaining boisterous. Seth looked around at me, give me your gun. What? Your gun? He held out his hand, expecting me to hand it to him, which I did. Don't really shoot him. <laughs> he aimed at the floor, bang! Sawdust flew up, scattering wood chips like plucked chicken feathers. <coughs> the piano melody slowed, cards handed folded. <coughs> Beer mugs clanked to the tables. Low curses and mutterings echoed off the walls. All eyes turned to Seth and me. Now I had their attention. We need about ten of you to ride with us, I said. How many of you can bring your own horse? Silence. How many can provide your own guns? Silence. A couple of heads pivoted, looking around the room. I was desperate. <coughs> Excuse 
stupid. So how about if town loads your horse? I was desperate now. Sure didn't want to track those men alone. And a gun. Seth, Seth leaned in close. Maybe offered to pay them. So that tells us, hopefully, it moves the action forward, right? Well, yeah, move the action forward. Did she get her posse? Well, you'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> so who wants to, who wanted to win that scene? Obviously, Maude, the sheriff, did. She wanted to win the scene by people saying, oh, all right, yeah, absolutely, I want to be on the posse. Nobody would cooperate. They wanted to win the scene by changing the subject. You know, oh, you know, hey, come with, you know, you can be my gal. You can bake me a pie. Yeah, she didn't have a lot of respect. Okay. I put, the reason I'm looking up here is I normally am on top, on top of all this. I, I know what I'm going to say. I have my notes. But this morning at 7 o'clock, I added a couple of uh, slides because I thought, oh, that would be so fun, and did not add them to my notes. <laughs> There's like an air gap in there, you know? So when you want to win the scene, your characters don't answer questions. And I had this happen to me, which I wanted to, to flatten the guy, but I, I didn't. I, we were in uh, Homer, Alaska, on the spit down there, and I had a poster that I wanted to mail. So I needed to know where the post office was. So I found the guy on the street, and I said, because uh, we were down on, on the, the spit, which is down at the water level, and there's uh, about three little hills all around it. So I ran into this guy and I said, hey, where's the post office? And he says, up the hill. I said, well, which hill? The big one. Was that helpful? No. No. I wanted to kick him, but I just, I, and then he walked off. He's like, I don't live here. I don't know what the big hill is. But he obviously won that scene because he didn't answer it. Be careful with asking closed questions. A closed question is one that you can be answered by yes or no. Uh, and we do this when, I remember, remember those days when our children were, were little, they come home from school, or you sitting there trying to get your homework done, and what happens? They, somebody in charge says, did you do your homework? <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah, right. That's a closed question. Do you want tacos for dinner? Yes. It doesn't really move the story forward at all. How much homework do you have left? Or how much homework do you have? They can't answer yes or no. Now they do short answers. Kids generally do, I don't know. That seems to be the universal answer. But you can get more out of them with dinner. Would you rather have tacos or burritos? At least that opens up the possibility of some dialogue. What happens when you ask those questions, you write yourself into a corner. And yes, I have done this. All of the stuff I have done and learned from it. So if you're stuck, if you're in a corner somewhere, if you're writing, Ask yourself, go back and look, did I write, did I ask any closed questions? If you did, change them around. Which jacket would you like to wear today, your red one or your blue one? Excuse me, instead of, do you want your red one? <coughs> Not all characters speak the same way. And that's kind of a, a duh, but we need to be reminded of that because I know at least in my mind, I, I see my characters and I know who they are, but I tend to get into my own speak and I'll start writing to where they all sound alike and pretty soon I'm like, uh-oh, wait, 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 no, 
these characters, they all, they all need to speak differently, and they don't have to, <coughs> to jive, and they, they don't have to um, be really weird in their speaking. They just need to do things that is, is characteristic of them. Some of them may not speak in complete sentences, ever. We know people like that, right? Yeah. There's a, possibly your character never speaks uh, with contractions. Maybe your character has a key word that they use, like shiny. How are you doing? I'm shiny. I saw a shiny car today, you know, literally and, and figuratively. You might come up, or, and, or if you're in tune with your characters, which you should be, they will let you know what their best word is, what they would like to say all the time. And they'll, they'll tell you. If, if they don't tell you, give them one. Uh, because you're in charge. You know, you, you've got the power. Uh, tell them what they like to say, and eventually, if they like it, they'll keep it. If not, they'll move on. You know, it's so nice to be in a, a room with writers who understand when the voices in your head start speaking. <laughs> okay. Yes. I have a question on that subject. Okay. Um, what are the oil So, um, how much of an accent do you present? Okay. I'm going to get to that momentarily. Thank you. Yes. How much of an accent do you put in? Actually, I believe that's two more times. One thing to be aware of is that men and women speak differently. We all know that, but sometimes paying attention to that is two different things. Men and women speak differently, and I'm going to do a little bit of stereotyping here, so excuse me for stereotyping. <coughs> men and women have the same emotions. We do. We all love, we all hate, we all have sorrow, we all have all sorts of emotions. We all have them. But the way we demonstrate them are different. And I'm talking verbally, because this is about dialogue. Stereotypically, men don't speak as much as women do. It's our job as women to talk. <laughs> and we do it quite well. If you ever watch uh, couples walking down the street on their morning walk, it's usually the woman who's talking. Because it's part of our DNA, it's part, you know, we have to sign on the dotted line uh, that we're going to talk. Again, that's stereotyping, because I know some, some women who are not talkers, but I know an awful lot who are. <clears throat> not me, of course. <laughs> Generally, men don't speak as nearly as much as we do. They have figured out how to make a statement in one or two words, maybe a short sentence, but it takes us at least two or three paragraphs. <laughs> also, with, and again, I'm stereotyping here, but there's a lot of truth to this. When women have problems, like with their husbands or boyfriends or what, kids or whoever, they will seek out other women to talk to them and, and talk and talk and talk and talk, especially if there's wine involved. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of talking. Men, they will go work on a car, and there's a, sometimes a lot of talking there, but it's about the busted knuckles and things like that. Um, typically, or stereotypically, men don't tend to share their feelings like women do. I do know men who do that; they share, uh, and it's always nice, but stereotypically, they don't. So think about also the age of your characters. A little guy who's three is going to react very differently and say different things than a 13-year-old would, than a 33-year-old would, or a 63-year-old would. They might say this, they might have the same exact emotion, but they're going to say it differently. <coughs> so we need to keep that in mind. Male, female, age. needs to help build the character.
And you can do that in a number of ways. Remember earlier I mentioned that um, somebody might say, oh, Bill, you know, I, I, I don't like snakes. And of course, if it's a woman saying that, she's going to say, oh, Bill, you know I don't like snakes. Don't bring that thing around me. I really don't like it. Go ahead and kill it. If it's a guy, who goes, Bill, don't like snakes. And she's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have the same emotions, but we, we uh, attack life differently. But it needs to build the character. Build the character. Oh, number seven. Oh, I love this one. Here we go. I don't have my notes on this. I apologize. It looks like I'm not with it, but I am. <laughs> you don't want to have something like this. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Fine. Yourself? Can't complain. What's new? Nothing. How about you? Nothing. <laughs> Did that build the character and move the action forward? No. no. If you read that in a book, would you be upset? Yeah, you spent money for this? Okay, next one. This is much, much better. Hey, Joe, heard about your car wreck? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Took my wife to the hospital, but now she won't get back in the car to come home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can see a whole short story on that one. Yeah. Moves the plot forward, moves the characters forward. What is that guy going to do? How's he going to get his wife in the car? Oh, what a difference. I'm just saying. Okay, next one. Can you all see this one okay? No. Okay. This is one of my favorite slides. <laughs> Read your dialogue out loud. Read your dialogue out loud. Now you're going to, here's a couple of ideas. If it, if it needs to sound, well, if it needs, it needs to sound right. It needs to sound like dialogue. It really does. Because your readers demand dialogue that's, that's real. So you read it out loud. <clears throat> I'm in a critique group where I'm lucky enough that we read our stories aloud. And that is so helpful. If you're not able to do that, you still need to read your dialogue out loud. And if you have someone at home who's willing to listen to it, or maybe even participate, give them another copy and let them maybe be the other person. That's kind of fun. That's like screenwriters. <laughs> or if you're at home alone and you really need to get this read, one thing I learned when I was acting, uh, when I was in college, was stand in front of a refrigerator. Now that seems like a dumb thing to do, stand in front of a refrigerator, but they're about our size. If you don't want to uh, read to your dog or your cat or your gerbil, read to the the refrigerator. It doesn't it doesn't wander off. <laughs> it won't laugh. It won't you know it won't make any disparaging remarks about your choice of words. It just kind of stands there. What's nice about the refrigerator, like I said, it's about your size. Some of them are a little bigger, but still. I cannot recommend enough to read your dialogue out, out loud, especially in front of somebody else who can say, did that sound right? Generally, though, you'll pick it up. You'll go, oh, that, that's not right. Because it's maybe your dialogue is, um, Bill says, I went to the store today, Emily. Emily says, well, Bill, what did you buy at the store? <laughs> you can already see where I'm going with this, right? When you're writing in your head, and especially with your first draft, it makes sense. And they always tell you, get it down, just get your words down, and then you can go back and play with it and fix it. I don't usually work that way. I, what I do is I go through like line by line as I'm writing it. If I don't like it, I can't move on. Uh, I know Tony Hillerman used to go on all the time, and then he'd go back and fix it. I go back and fix it sometimes seven, eight, ten times, which reminds me one time in a game of Southwest Writers, somebody who was smarter than me said, oh, you're going to revise your, your manuscript at least seven times. 
And I was new enough, I went, oh man, if you can't get it done the first time, you're going to write it this way. <laughs> yeah. Here I am, like on revision number eight, ten. Much smarter. But read it out loud. Yes, right. Many word processing programs now have the ability to uh, transfer what you've written on the page into spoken. Uh, it it does. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you can get around having a computer read to you, yeah, you write. That, and that's definitely one way to go. You can say uh, some of these uh, programs now can, will read it back to you. It's, it's amazing what's on there. Okay, next one. Here we go. Be careful of stereotypes, slang, profanity, and dialect. <coughs> stereotypes are easy to write because we already know what they're supposed to be. You have the dump wand, the, the waitress, you know, the, the dolly parking wig and the waitress and the truck stop. You know, we've got all that. We have the strong, silent jocks, the athletes, who uh, have like four working brain cells. <laughs> you know, I really think stereotypes are based on real people, but nobody we know, right? Uh, maybe you have, uh, maybe a lawyer. Lawyers are supposed to be really, really smart, right? That's a stereotype. I've run into a couple who are not the brightest balls in the hat. <laughs> be careful about that. And in this day and age, you have to be careful not to offend anybody. Uh, those of us who write westerns, we call the Indians Indians. They're not Native Americans. They're Indians because that's what they used the terms back then. They used other terms as well, but some of those are, I'm not going to write. So you have, it's a dance that we do. Sometimes your reader will expect that stereotype or that, that word of whatever it is that you're writing. And that's, you know, that's between you and your editor, you and your publisher, or you and your reader. And basically it's about how you feel about it. Profanity, be careful. Now, I know that some characters are going to be profane. They use a lot of profanity. An editor for a, an audio book company that I used to write for was telling me something one time that I had not really thought about this. He said, if your book has, has profanity in it, he says, I probably won't publish it. I said, well, why is that? He said, because an audio book affects everybody around. <coughs> Whoever listened to this one book, there's other people can hear it children, old people, people who don't like that kind of language and don't need it. It's, just, it's, it's not appropriate for audiobooks, which I thought was interesting. You might pick one or two words. My characters say damn and hell on occasion. Uh, a couple of my, one of my books, they were caught by two of the guys who were caught by Cochise. Um, not a good time for them, but somehow I avoided a lot of the profanity, which I'm sure went through their minds, but they did not utter. <clears throat> so just be careful. Think about who's going to read your book, and is that appropriate for your character? The slang, what slang does, is it dates you. I like to use the word cool and groovy because it dates me. I remember when Groovy was the cat's meow. That, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what you said. You know? Um, but it still dates your characters. It dates your writing. So if you use, because truthfully, unless you're uh, being self-published, uh, it's going to take a year or two to get your book on the market. And especially here in New Mexico, we always seem to be the last person to come up with the trends. Um, and so if they're using the word, for example, uh, catnip back in the East, we won't get that word here until the end of the year. And so if you use catnip, uh, people in the East are going to go, oh, that is so last century. 
last decade. So just be careful with the slang. Dialect, yeah. Uh, does the same hold true for something that um, this character maybe, let's say, is a rodeo rider or a ballet dancer or whatever, and those worlds kind of have their own language, their own jargon. How much, um, I'm thinking of a musician where I used the, the term green room and people in the room didn't know what that was. And so how far do you, I believe this is who's gonna read my book and I'm gonna stick with it. Huh. She was asking about terms that um, a lot of people don't, aren't familiar with, like the word green room when they come. A green room is a place where the uh, actors go to relax and uh, kind of get their nerves under control and a place where if they're not on the, in the scene, they have some place to go. Um, if you're not, if you if you don't think your readers are familiar with it, for example, if you're writing a, a magazine article for Theater Today, you can use Green Room with no problem. If you're writing a story, you need to work that in. If you uh, if you have any concern that your, your readers aren't going to know that word, then you need to work it in. Um, and say, uh, since Bill wasn't on stage at the moment, he needed to relax. And so he found uh, space in the green room where all the actors go. Just maybe a little phrase that, that helps you with that. So yeah, Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I actually did that. I found okay, good. a very short yeah. segment that could bring it in. But, uh, right, yeah. And it doesn't have to be long, it's just a little quick. So we were talking about Five minutes. We were talking about um, dialect. And dialect, I think I've got a slide up here. I love this. Don't write it like the first one. I reckon I have to go down to the river today because we've got all fish we're going to need. Boy, is that stereotyping and dialect. Could you get through that easily? No. no. Do you want your readers to have to work? No, because what's going to happen? They're going to check the book. A little bit of dialect. You introduce the person, maybe, uh, in this particular case, it's a Cajun uh, fisherman. He's down on the muddy banks of the Mississippi. and. You already have set up where they are, and so your reader can hear what they're saying. So you give them a brief, brief, brief introduction to the, the, the dialect. That's why apostrophes are wonderful. You get the gist of it without having to spell it out. I, read a, I reviewed a book one time, and it was, it was set in South Texas, and it was Oh, the whole thing was written like this top one. Oh, it was it was painful. And when I got done with it, finally, I read a lot of the back so I could understand what was going on. When I wrote my review, I most of my review was I couldn't understand a word that this person said, and blah blah blah. Well, I got an email back from the guy who wrote it. He goes, well, that's how we talk in South Texas. And I said, but that's the way we don't talk around here. And so I couldn't read your writing. And he didn't respond. <laughs> Question? Yes. Um, some of my characters speak Brooklynese, yeah. which is a different language. Um, so should I just put a smattering in? I was smattering. A smattering. Yeah. 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 That's a good question. It's do you support it or do you just kind of let it go if you have a foreign uh, phrase? Um, I've done a couple different ways with that. I've had the next person in speaking order say, so you were asking me about or you were telling me about what you're going to do this week. And so that kind of you know explains exactly what the guy said. Um, <clears throat> I, 
don't ever give a definition, and heaven states don't put, you know, asterisks and give us you know, information down at the bottom. <clears throat> um, let me talk to you about this afterwards. Just yeah, because you want you want to have the flavor, but you don't want people to, to try to figure out what they have to talk about, right? <clears throat> let me go really fast, and then uh, we'll be done. says break up dialogue with action and vice versa. You don't want pages and pages of dialogue. You need to break up the act, break up the dialogue with some action. The, the times you have characters, a group of characters sitting around at Thanksgiving dinner, right? And it's called pass the potatoes. They can't, they don't really go anywhere and they don't do anything, they talk. But there needs to be some action, so it's past the potatoes. Or one of your characters can stand up and go get more, more, I don't know, champagne. There needs to be some action. The same way is if you've got pages and pages of action, which is what I like to write, you're going to fatigue your reader, and so you need to break that up. Put some dialogue in there. It doesn't have to be much. A sentence or two. Okay, Michelle. And then, remember that your characters, people breathe while speaking. And if you're, when you're reading your dialogue aloud, and you have to take a breath, you've got too much dialogue. Question. Um, how many he says he answered while writing his mouth for? I get bored writing he says, she answered. Okay, she's asking about tags. The he said, she said. Always use he says, she says. Don't use blustered, yawned. Um, just, you know, we all know that the, the, the writer has a thesaurus and you can come up with some really cool words. Just use said. What I would do, the, the rule of thumb is if you've got two characters speaking and they're the only two in the room, you only need a tag about every fifth line, and that, that keeps the reader straight. If you have three, it needs to be almost every every other line. Uh, and if you can put action in there instead of said, do that. So something like, um, Joe, would you sit down, he said. How about, Joe, would you sit down? The, the teacher pointed the ruler at Joe again. So instead of saying with that tag, he said, you put in action. Does that make sense? Kind of sort of? So when you're reading these books, look at how they handle the tags. And if there's any of those silly, uh, he yawned, she blustered, uh, he yelled even. If you have to say they yelled, you didn't do your job as the writer right. And that's, that's why we're here. Um, next slide. Thank you very much. <laughs>